Welcome to Morningstar Christian Chapel. If you're watching on YouTube, please remember to hit that subscribe button, like button, and the notification bell so you can find out when we go live or we post a new video. And be sure to leave a comment about what God has shown you in this message. Thanks, and enjoy the study. Uh, Daniel chapter 4 this morning for our study. <clears throat> Daniel was 15 years old when he, as well as 3,023 others, according to uh, Jeremiah 52, were taken in that first invasion by the Babylonians who had just really come to world power, Nebuchadnezzar being the ruler of the world, and he began conquering, and Judah was, uh, Jerusalem was certainly on his list. He brought a bunch of young kids to train. He put them in school there in Babylon for three years so that he could use them as emissaries between the captive people that he anticipated would come and uh, his government, if you will. Daniel and, the, and the, the three boys that were introduced to in Daniel's book um, were trained for three years about the culture, the language, the ways of the Babylonians. Their names were changed by the king. They were indoctrinated, if you will. Daniel took his stand there. You might remember in chapter one about the food that he as a good Jew would eat and what he hoped he didn't have to eat. And, and with a test and, and with God's help, they were able to stand fast when after three years, the uh, examinations, the oral exams were given by the king. They, they were the best at what they did, and so they were promoted, and God had his men planted in the government, the world government of the Babylonians. Three years later, in chapter 2, God gave to Nebuchadnezzar a dream. He didn't remember it. He certainly didn't know what it meant. His magicians failed him. He wanted to have them killed, but Daniel stood up and said, no, no, I'll tell you what you've dreamt and what it means, why God is able and as you read this, the chapter, you realize that God gave to Nebuchadnezzar a picture of a uh, vision of a, a statue, if you will, an image. He was the head of gold. He was the first, uh, or at least from that time forward, the, the first of the world kingdoms. There had been two others. And then proceeding down this body of this image, the, 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 the kingdoms that would follow all the way to the, the kingdom of the Antichrist and then the return of Jesus Christ. So that Nebuchadnezzar was told, you are a world, world leader, but your kingdom is not going to last. It's going to have an end. Well, 23 years after that, chapter 3, 581 B.C., Daniel's away, but the three boys are in town when, when a more powerful Nebuchadnezzar introduces to, to the world and to his people a 90-foot-high image of gold. No longer worried about God's word that he's only a part of these world kingdoms. He believed he was the, the, the only one. Demand that people worship uh, or, or die. You remember the story we went over it about the three boys who decided they weren't bowing or bending and they certainly weren't going to burn. And God took care of them. And uh, again, another lesson to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, that he's not as powerful as he thinks that he is, but the God of Daniel and the others certainly was. This morning in chapter four, we jump 20 more years ahead, eight of which is in the chapter itself. Daniel is now about 60 years old. He's been serving in captivity uh, for 45 years. Nebuchadnezzar historically has absolutely overthrown the world. There was no one left to fight. There was no threat yet left to deal with. There's nothing for him to face. Back in chapter 1, he had taken some of the artifacts from the temple in Jerusalem and put them in the, the kingdom or, or the temple of his own gods and kind of mocked the God of the Jews. With, with passing time, the, he thought more and more of himself and less and less of the God of Israel. If you've read Ezekiel or Jeremiah, and we kind of have gone through some of them just to look at the prophets, uh, God gave to ne Nebuchadnezzar through these men plenty of warnings about how God allowed him to rule because he was the choice that God was going to use to punish his people, but then he would be responsible to the Lord for his behavior and that God would deal with him. Well, it's been a lot of years, but God's about to deal with him in a big-time way here in chapter 4. And it's time for his pride to be, to be shaken. So with all that God has put him through and, and, and showed him that there's no you know, permanent power, he, he continues to, as he goes older, be more self-confident and more assured of himself, that, that absolute power corrupting absolutely. So by the time we get to chapter 4 here, ne Nehemiah, uh, Nehemiah, I've said that twice now, Nebuchadnezzar is at the height of his success, 
and God gives him his second dream. It is the first step in a very long process, seven plus years, eight years now, where he was going to finally come out the other end and see that God was good and just and gracious, and most importantly, that the Lord rules in the kingdom of men. Daniel chapter 4 is an important chapter because it is written in Nebuchadnezzar's own hand. Daniel just was dictated to and he wrote it down. It's the only portion in your Bible that was written by a pagan Gentile ruler to give his personal testimony. It is not written in Hebrew like the rest of the Old Testament. It is written in Aramaic. And it ends with a song of praise to the Lord and to the God that he had come to know. I can't imagine the impact or how, how phenomenal it must have been for a fellow that is absolutely world, the world ruler, no one even close to threatening his power, who writes a tract about his own salvation and then demands that all of the nations of the earth read it. It must have been quite something. He writes about being king of the world. He writes about losing his mind for seven years and, and becoming like an animal living in, in the fields and waking up with the dew of the grass upon him. He writes about the fact that he um, realized that after seven years that the Lord was the only one that he could worship, that God would rule in the kingdom of men, that only his rule would last forever. But my, this guy did not go easily into the good night. He speaks about how God changed his life, the peace that the Lord gave him, the joy that he found, the restoration that he had sought, he acknowledges the Lord it is. <clears throat> it's an absolutely amazing chapter because Nebuchadnezzar is one of the cruelest men in history. Just read about him secularly and, and you shake your head. But you, but you have to say, look, if God can reach him, he can certainly reach everyone on your prayer list today. This guy was out there about as far as you can. God can even save politicians. I am convinced that Daniel and the boys must have had Nebuchadnezzar at the top of their prayer list for decades. But I just can't imagine how they must have felt when they saw God was actually able to get through to this man's heart. It reminded me a lot of the, the centurion when Jesus was asked by him to come heal his servant. The Lord said, I'll just, I'll just come to your house. And the Lord said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you come under my house. And he said that he was an authority and he could say to somebody, go and they'd go or come and he comes or do this and they do that. And he said, Lord, if you'll just say, if you just speak the word, I know my servant will be healed. He recognizes the Lord's authority over life. And that is really what Nebuchadnezzar is going to have to learn too. God is in charge over our lives. It is, an, like I said, an incredible chapter. Just, just to recognize what God has done in his life. One of the things that you always notice when people come in contact with the Lord really, like he will, is, is not only that he changes your life, but one of the things that changes immediately is you recognize his authority. It, it's something that you can't get away from. All of a sudden, he's the Lord and you're not, right? More than anything else, you're on his fa your face and, and he's the Lord and you're not. Isaiah in chapter 6, verse 5, when King Uzziah died, he said that he... He, he said, woe is me, Lord. He saw the Lord high and lifted up. Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips and come from a people like that as well. But my eyes have seen the king. Peter, when he went fishing with the Lord there in Luke 5 and, and he realized that that person in his boat was not a good, only a good man or a good prophet, he was the Lord himself. He, fall, he fell on his face in the boat. Depart me from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. He fell to his knees. Lord, please. <laughs> And he recognized the authority of the Lord. That old, you know, that old saying that said, if, if, if your religion hasn't changed you, maybe it's time to change your religion. Well, that was what's going to happen to this king of the world. God was going to turn his life upside down and begin a work in it that, he, that would last forever. You that have met the Lord and know him should learn from this chapter, if nothing else, that your personal testimony about how God got to you and how he made himself known to you is, is one of the most powerful tools that you have. That, that in your ministry to, and mission to go reach the world with the gospel, that you have a journey with Christ that is unique. Now, you might think it's not as dramatic as this guy's, and I would agree it probably is not. But that's not what happens, and that's not what matters. You should have a testimony. In fact, 
I, I would encourage you to work on your verbal testimony. Sit down and write it out and, and work on it and develop it and, and use it. Let the Lord use you. I remember going to my 10-year high school reunion with a friend in whose house I got saved. And he was very happy about introducing me to all of our high school buddies as Pastor Jack. He thought this was just hilarious because I used to deal a lot of drugs. Let's just put it that way. And, and everybody came and talked to me for two minutes and then they ran away. They didn't want anything to do with me at all. But since then, half a dozen, no, almost 10 guys that I know in my graduating class have, have gotten saved. There's a testimony. You have one. You should use it. Well, this morning, I just want to look at the first 18 verses of this chapter. I want to save the rest for, for next week, kind of take it in two steps. But we will begin with a lesson that is repeated six times in this one chapter, in verse 3 and 17 and 25 and 32 and 34 and 35, where we read this. You have to learn that God rules in the kingdom of men. Somehow, the thing we have to learn more than anything else in that authority structure is that God is in charge. He rules. He rules in our situation. He rules in our government. He rules. And by the time we get to the end of this chapter, Nehemiah, uh, Nehemiah, <laughs> there we go. Moses, <laughs> no, never mind. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar will be saved in the Old Testament sense. I fully expect to meet him one day in heaven. I think he will as well. So verse 1. <clears throat> Nehemiah's own writing, all of this written in Aramaic. Ne 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 uh, ne Nebuchadnezzar, I just call him Neb. Neb the king, he writes to all of the people, nations, and languages that are dwelling upon the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. I can just see this going out on official Babylonian letterhead. The document of the spiritual autobiography of the king of the world. And how he came to know the God of the, of the universe, the almighty God. Notice he states the purpose for his writing in verse 2. The lessons that he had learned personally about the Lord that he was now serving in verse 3. He sa sounds ex uh, extremely different from the guy that you read about in, in chapter 3, like in verses 13, 14, 15. You know, if you try to defy me, you know, what God is going to stand against me? Well, he's going to learn now. This man had been changed by the Lord. Although this was a written decree sent to all of the world, I, I thought about how, how amazing would it be if a president would take the State of the Union address in front of the Congress, get on television, and say loudly to everyone, I've come to know the Lord personally. I, I was a tough guy. I had a lot of pride. I needed to be dealt with severely <clears throat> to surrender my life to him. But he is God alone. He rules in the kingdom of men. He does whatever he wants. He's the Lord. And, and what an impact that must have had. Uh, on those who got this. Notice, if you will, as we're reading this, it's all written in the first person. This is a personal testimony from a man whose life has been changed. Here's what I've learned, and here's how I learned it. Verse 4, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house, and I was flourishing in my palace. When I had a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts of my bed and the visions on my head began to trouble me. Nebuchadnezzar, because he is now older in life and pretty much towards the end of his reign, has hit the good years. I mean, the word flourish means just that. It's an Ara uh, Aramaic, uh, Aramaic word for green or, or growing like a field, if you will. His life was at ease. He was on top. There was no one to bother him, no one to challenge him. He could sleep with great self-satisfaction. But unfortunately, when he laid his head down, he had a dream that troubled him. He had never lost a battle. Oh, there were some skirmishes historically, but, but, but in the big picture, he had never lost any wars, if, if, if we put it that way. And the world was officially at his feet. He would have been a hard man to reach, certainly a hard man to terrify, uh, to shake him, if you will. But for the second time in his life, as the Lord had done 40 years earlier, in chapter 2, his life is shaken. He's a slow learner for sure. He doesn't quite 
put it together. And, and now there's been 20 more years that have passed and another 23 years prior to that other one. So it's been years. And, and here's this defiant old <laughs> world ruler, if you will, full of himself and his ways. And yet, until this time, he hasn't been listening to everything the Lord had showed him. Daniel with the dream, and here's what it means. Head of gold, but you're never going to last forever. The kid's getting thrown in the fire and just coming back out. I mean, he had plenty of reasons to go, maybe I should pay attention. But he didn't pay attention. Which ought to tell you that, you know, God can move your life and impress you and shake you and frighten you, make himself known to you, and you can still walk away. This fellow sure did. So, he has this next dream. This one he remembers, the one 40 years older, earlier, earlier he did not. He knew it was about him from what we read. It seemed ominous. It left him greatly afraid. It's a strong word in Aramaic. He was shaken to the core. The most powerful, prideful man in the world knew that this was not good news. <clears throat> I don't think I've ever had a dream from the Lord that was predictive or directive. Most of my wildest dreams are having a burrito after Wednesday night service and going to sleep. But I think it would be cool. I mean, I would be happy to hear one. I was reading, and as I was reading, I thought to myself, how often does God give dreams to people in the Bible? So I went to do some research. And one of the things I discovered that is that most folks who were given dreams, kind of directive, predictive dreams from the Lord, we're not given those dreams because they were special or spiritual. In fact, it seems to be just the opposite. Most of the time, it was God needing to say something to them, even if their hearts were necessarily open to the Lord. Pharaoh had that dream about the, the seven fat cows and the seven skinny ones, you might remember. Laban had a dream in Genesis about God's dealing with him there at the well. The Midianites, as they were assaulting Israel, had a dream and a warning from the Lord Pontius Pilate's wife had a dream about Jesus, and she came and shared it with him. So God now speaks to this powerful man, no more powerful upon the earth, in a dream to shake his life for the second time. We read in verse 6, as he continues his testimony, Therefore I issued a, a decree to bring all of the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of this dream. And so they brought in the magicians and astrologers, the Chaldeans, another word for Babylonians, and the soothsayers came in, and I told them the dream, but they didn't make known to me the interpretation. But at last, Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God. In him is the spirit of the holy God. And I told the dream before him, saying, Belteshazzar, uh, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you and no secret troubles you, explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen and its interpretations. As before, back in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar called out for the best the Babylonians had to offer, the magicians, the, the cultics, the, the stargazers, Back in chapter 2, he disdained them for their phoniness and, and had ordered to kill them had not Daniel intervened because he realized that these guys were more hustlers than they were truth. You read this and you say to yourself 40 years later, why didn't he just call Daniel first? He, he certainly knows he's batting a thousand and God speaks to him. But it's interesting that, that spiritual blindness doesn't make you sensible. And when you're under pressure in the world, you always reach for the familiar. Not that it'll help you, but you're comfortable with that. And so he calls for the guys he's always kind of hung out with. Uh, unfortunately, nothing had changed with them. In fact, now, back in chapter 2, they made excuses. Now they're just going, yeah, we don't know. And I think it's because they looked over their shoulder and went, yeah, Daniel's coming in next anyway. We're going to look like idiots. We just don't say anything at all. Daniel had a tremendously good reputation, even better track record. So Nebuchadnezzar calls the religious guys who he tolerated and he was familiar with. And isn't that usually the way the world is? They turn to their familiar gods until it's life and death. And then they usually go to you. 
because they realize the gods that they serve can't give them any peace or any hope. So, finally, verse 8 and 9, they call Daniel. And again, the Lord is showing the king the difference between the God of Daniel and these false gods that the Babylonians bowed their hearts to. And the king was about to go from hopeless, fearful, to hopeful as he laid his eyes upon Daniel, remembered the years of faithfulness that Daniel had showed him. I just want to point out to you that the, the words that you read here, in you is the spirit of the holy God, is certainly not the way it is written in Aramaic. It literally says it is the spirit of the holy God, small g, and then plural. These are not words of faith. These are words of recognition that there's something different with Daniel, but he certainly isn't crying out to God or Daniel's God as the next eight years would unfold and show you. Needless to say, he did see there was a difference between this group and Daniel. Like I said, he was a slow learner. Um, he does in verse 8 tell us that one of the reasons he changed Daniel's name was to kind of you know, strip him of his identity and identify him with the gods of the Babylonians. It was that classic kind of psychological ploy. Um, I like the fact that as Daniel is led by the Lord to help this guy understand this dream, that for the first time in 45 years, Daniel is seeing that the Lord is, is cracking the army of this armor of this very tough guy. I think it was ha uh, Vance Havner who used to, he was the chaplain for the, for the, uh, for the Congress for years, he said that sometimes when he went to preach, he said he preached, uh, what did he call them, time bombs. <laughs> he said, I preach to people, and then 10 years later, it goes off. Well, 40 years later, it's about to go off here for Nebuchadnezzar. So I, I just point out to you in verse 8 and 9, his, his, his outlook upon Daniel was pagan in the sense that he had no spiritual really insight, but he did acknowledge the work in Daniel's life. In fact, in this chapter, three times he will mention that Daniel has... A, a different spirit, if you will, than everyone else. And I like that because it seems to me if you're going to go out to the world to be a witness, you shouldn't have to say to people, I'm a Christian. They should just go, they're Christians, right? People should see that in us. And, and like I said, it was ignored by the king until he needed help. But the, the minute the wheels came off of his life, he went to Daniel. I think it was Henry Stanley who found uh, David Livingston in, uh, in, in Africa and six months later, um, Livingston, uh, Stanley uh, no, Livingston, sorry, sorry uh, Stan, you got saved. And he said, it wasn't because Livingston preached to me, because he never did. He said, but he lived the kind of life, and I watched him, and I wanted to be like him. And I wanted what he had. It's kind of like the rich young ruler watching Jesus. I want what you have. And I would say that to you because so often, you know, you walk out of the world and you wonder what the Lord is doing with you. Hey, the world's watching you, especially if they know you're saved. You're claiming a relationship with God. And you don't have to say anything, but you're living in a fishbowl, man. People are they're, they're looking for reasons to not believe you. But at the same time, they're hoping you're right <laughs> so that they might follow with you. So here in verse 9, Nebuchadnezzar's assessment of Daniel was that nothing secret would bother him. And though he didn't go to him first... He does seem to say, I trust him in him the most. I found that often that in the world, you know, <laughs> they just run to their friends and hang out with people and their, whoever believes like they do. But the minute trouble is coming, they call the church. Hey, could you pray for us? Well, why are you calling us? Well, you guys, you know, are church. They go to you when it, the trouble is, is, is overwhelming. Daniel was known as a man who wasn't easily rattled, one who could keep his eyes on the Lord, wasn't shaken by circumstance. I've watched you, Daniel. Help me out here. Well, then he tells him this dream, verse 10. These are the visions of my head while I was upon my bed. I was looking, and behold, there was a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew, became strong, its heights reached the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were lovely its fruit abundant, and it was food for all, and the beasts of the field would find shade under it, and the birds of the heavens dwelling in its branches, and all of the flesh was fed from it. And I saw in the visions of my head while I was upon my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, 
coming down from heaven. And he cried aloud and said thus, chop down the tree, cut off the branches, strip off the leaves and scatter the fruit, and let the beast get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and the roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him graze with the beasts on the grass of the earth, and let his heart be changed from that of a man, let him be given the heart of a beast, and seven times may it pass over him. And this is the decision by the decree of the watchers, and the sentence by the word of the holy ones, in order that the living may know that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men. He gives it to whomever he wants, and he can set over it even the lowest of men. And I, this dream I, Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, declare it in interpretation, since all of the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, because in you is the spirit of the holy gods. I love verse 13. He saw a watcher. And notice the word watcher there is singular. In verse 14, it is masculine, he. In verse 17, it is the word plural, watchers. I think it is accurate to believe that that is the, a picture of the Godhead, if you will. God watching over his will to be made known his desire to draw this wicked king to himself. God is knowing, God knows, and God sees all. I think that's the point. God is seeing what you're going through here, Nebuchadnezzar, who you are. I think it was Lewis uh, Sperry Schaefer, who, he's a commentator who wrote, secret sins upon the earth are open scandals in heaven. I like that. It, it is something that God you know, sees. When no one else is watching, he still is. Well, notice from verse 14 that the, the watcher had a terrible announcement to make. The, tr the tree that was flourishing, that had reached to the heavens, that could be seen from all over the world. Nebuchadnezzar understood he was this tree, or his kingdom certainly was. That he had been, you know, just uh, the, the source of food and, and, and comfort, and, and the animals found joy, the f all flesh found, found food. He had been that sustainer in many ways. But now comes this terrible announcement. This, this tree would be cut down. The stump would be preserved. It looked like the end, but it was not. Re restoration could follow. He had said back in verse 4, I'm flourishing in my palace. I am doing so well. Well, that was about to end. <clears throat> and so to, first of all, verse 15, it, the tree, then to him, God begins to speak to this man. He's going to be cut down. And here's the judgment. He's going to be given, verse 16, the heart of a beast. And for seven times, the word seven times is a, a word that is used a lot in prophecy to speak of years. You can find it twice, I think, in chapter 7 of this book, or actually three times, and then in Revelation 12 as well. So for seven years, if you will, prophetically, you're going to be given the heart of an animal rather than a man. You're going to find yourself eating grass in the fields. You're going to lose your mind. There is a psychotic disorder, although it is rare, where people find themselves to think that they are animals rather than people and begin to act that out. Um, <laughs> this, this ruler of the world wasn't going to look too good for very long. There are two, by the way, secular sources, if you, I always like them, <laughs> that you can go find the the years of Nebuchadnezzar's illness. There was a, a Babylonian historian called Bersabas who wrote of it in his annals. There's a Greek historian, Asinius, who, who in 286 BC made reference to the king who had lost his mind for several years. Um, so here, the king of the world, the guy who's just so proud of himself, will be reduced to this psychotic behavior. He doesn't understand yet. He's just had a dream. But he feels this dream is not going to be very good for him. And so 
Notice in verse 17 that the decree was made by the Lord, the overseer, that the sentence was given, that this was going to have to take place for these years in this man's life to really lose his mind, so that he might come out of the other side with this understanding that the Lord rules in the kingdom of men, that God will give the oversight of the world to whoever he wants. And this isn't just going to be Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, you should read at the bottom there something very important, verse 17. He will even give it to the basest of men, the lowest of men. In other words, sometimes God puts into power those who are just the worst. So the decree was made. I think that's been proved out in government. But God decides. God rules. Now, put yourself in Nehemiah, uh, Nehemiah goodness gracious, ne Neb's shoes. Um, he's writing this in retrospect. In other words, he's gone through this seven-year period. In fact, he's going to have a year to digest this, and then he's not going to listen, and then he's going to have seven years of this punishment, if you will, or this, this horror in his life to come to the right conclusion. But, but he writes so, uh, already looking back, God took me through this thing as horrible as it was so that I might learn that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men, that God appoints human governments, that God oversees them all. And whether it is, you know, the worst or the best, whether it is Pharaoh or Herod the Great or Antiochus Epiphanes or Nebuchadnezzar or Nero or Hitler or in modern times, never mind. <laughs> I can't do that. It, it hardly means that God approves of their behavior. That's not a conclusion you can draw. But he reserves control of the appointment. And it really doesn't matter to you and I who God decides to place in power. We have the responsibility to submit to them as unto the Lord. It is a horribly difficult concept in our day of, 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 of rebellion and, and anger about what we see. But God decides who will rule in the kingdom of men. He gives it to whoever he wants, and sometimes it's the worst. He gives it to the worst. Why? Well, just go by your Bible. God used wicked rulers to punish those who are transgressors, to avenge his name being slandered, to purify his own. He does everything well. So what is your responsibility? No, I, he rules. Let's submit to him. And unless we are told by our government to do something God expressly forbids, or we are kept by our government from doing something which God expressly demands, you have an obligation to serve, to honor, to obey. Moses' parents saved their little boy from the Nile because the order was uh, an offense to the Lord. The boys in Acts 4, when they were told no longer to preach in Jesus' name, went, yeah, I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to to do that. The boys in the previous chapter, being told to bow down before an image, said we won't do that either. But even when defiance is necessary, biblically, so is the willingness to accept the consequences of the defiance. It isn't thought, it's just do with me what you want, I can't do what you demand. Otherwise, we are to obey the Lord and the law, whether you like those over you or not. Verse 18, Nebuchadnezzar says, this scared me. What does it mean? Daniel, can you help me? I don't understand. Next week, we'll find out what it means. Father, thank you this morning for your word to us. How good it is to, to learn that, Lord, your desire is to bring us to that place where we may allow you to be the Lord of our life. And that the battle so often comes down to who's in authority, who's in power, to whom will we bend our knee? To watch this old gentleman who had lived a life of privilege and power and, and was at the height of his success now find himself losing his mind, going through the, the absolute worst a life could be for seven years, only to emerge singing your praises. And now he's able to say to the world, Here's what I learned, and here's how I got there from here. Lord, that we would be encouraged that the
the quicker we can allow you to be the Lord of our life, the better. And thank you, Lord, that you rule today in the kingdom of men. We look around, I know there's politics is like, unfortunately in some churches, the, the thing that's preached well over the gospel. But certainly that's not necessary. We can just preach Christ. He's the one that we look to. <laughs> and sometimes it's the basis of men, but he's the Lord. And so we look to you, Lord, to give us what we, what we need by your grace. May, please don't give us what we deserve and watch over and protect us. But may, may we, like Nebuchadnezzar, learn quickly, Lord, that you're the Lord of our lives. We bow our needs to you. You're in charge. We rely upon you. We trust in you. And to you, we give honor and praise. We thank you for Nebuchadnezzar's testimony. What a chapter. Help us to have a, a testimony as well, we pray. Especially as we go out into the world <laughs> that really needs to hear what God can do. 